Listen for the word of God. Our first scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 934 in your pew Bible. The gift of love. If I speak in the tongues of mortal and of angel, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I have nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for kings, for, as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Here ends the reading. Our second scripture lesson morning is from the book of John chapter 4. You may follow along beginning on page 864. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who is it that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to her, him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty, or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. 
What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. But when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Here ends the reading. Thank you. Including Kentucky, 
the state where my mother was raised until she left and moved to Michigan as a young woman. Several states, even up until 2019, would not even marry individuals who refused to declare their race. Before loving and even after, intimate relationships across race was a dangerous proposition. But even more so, the social mores, myths, and attitudes about even the slightest contact was deeply ingrained in every thread of our society. Even though the law was monumental, the mold that had been cast put a strain on families often unseen. As a young child, I never understood why we never saw our Kentucky relatives. But pre-loving explains why my mother and father never traveled together to visit them in Kentucky, nor my father's relatives in Alabama. They married in 1947, and without a doubt, it was very dangerous for them to travel together to many places as a married couple. So consequently, we spent our early years without the benefit of an extended family or village. Unfortunately, by the time Loving versus Virginia in 1967 uh, was declared, they were divorced. In fact, their marriage only lasted about eight years. I was about five years old when my mother, when my white mother left my black father in our home, leaving me and my three siblings without a mother or what we thought was a normal family life. Caring for four kids on his own was indeed very difficult for my father, as you can imagine. I suspect being an interracial couple had its own unsurmountable, insurmountable challenges but as little kids, all we understood was that we no longer had a mother. We, had, we were abnormal in many ways, and something felt deeply broken in our lives. Our parents were just divorced, but my mother ran away. For so long, that was a weirdly and deeply negative stigma on our lives. We felt stigmatized by that fact but also for many years, even after the change in the law, we lived in a racial and social context that was often very harsh for ours and other families. Having its own challenges in society in general, each of us kids had to navigate a world that didn't look too kindly on little mutts, as we were often referred to. When my mother left and sought refuge with her white relatives, she wasn't welcome, especially if she was bringing those Negro children. In fact, 30 years separated from her New Jersey sister, who was deeply fearful of the idea of her friends, neighbors, or family, even knowing she had black relatives, to a sister and family in the segregated South, it bore hard on my mom and her short-lived marriage and how we as little children understood who we were. It is certainly without saying that life for my brothers and sister was often very difficult, and it didn't help that our father took little responsibility for the dysfunction in our family or its eventual breakup. He cried a lot, and even, and, and he even uh, at every turn blamed my mother for her so-called loose behavior and what he characterized as her little interest in being our mother. Needless to say, our immature hearts were confused by the many ways we heard his lament. If your mother only loved you, she'd never left. This was planted in our hearts for at least 10 years from the time mom left until we joined her to live here in Chicago as teenagers. Even then, as we came to live with her by choice, much disdain for her and what we thought was, we had much disdain for her and what we thought was her lifestyle, as was my dad's iteration often, shaped our contentious relationship. Not understanding the racial dynamics of their life, I hated that this was the life we had to endure. Everything she did in her life, I thought, was proof in the character characterization of her as white trash a woman without much worse worth for leaving her family. There were many days that I gave her nothing but pure hell. 
she could do no right, and being white in a racially charged environment was the ultimate betrayal for us as kids. We lived this reality consciously every day. In response to what I felt to be an assault on my existence, I in particular saw myself in contrast to her and lived to be as black as I could, especially and only in a way an angry and, angry and confused teenager could, could do. I was black and she was not. I was authentic and she was not. I was righteous and she was not. My mother was a single woman living in the big city in nothing but black communities. She even only had black boyfriends. This uh, deeply offended me. It confused me. I didn't need nor did I want her to be my mother. To me, she had very few qualities of a normal mother. Needless to say, in addition to normal teenage hate for their parents, she represented nothing we were or thought we were. I wanted someone else to be my mother, and I had plenty of friends who were willing to lend me theirs. Big Mama, that's right, Big Mama, my friend's grandmother was my pretend mother whenever I needed to prove to someone that I had a real mother, a black mother, a mother who stayed at home, who cooked dinner for her children every day, and made sure they went to school as ready as can be. Instead, I had a white mother who worked two to three jobs at a time, never seemed to have enough of anything, and we pretty much took care of ourselves. I prayed a lot to God to give me another mother, a black mother, a mother who was normal, especially what I thought to be normal, someone warm and cuddly, who stayed home and catered to our every need, and most of all, who looked like us. I felt none of that from her, I thought. I know that many times she deeply regretted being white because nothing in her life represented white. She tried as best she could, I suspect, to live the life she thought would make her acceptable to us. But to me, she never quite lived up to what I wanted. What I didn't know, though, she was what I needed. She wasn't the mother I wanted, but she proved to be the one I needed. She grew up in the, in the racially segregated South, but she transcended that. She defied that, and her resistance wasn't an easy route. What took me years to understand was the pain she endured leaving her children, which was necessary to save her life. She was strong and accepted the love of a village that had endured assault generation after generation. She taught us how to be an authentic village. She honored her adopted village. She understood that she was white and never tried to be anything else, but she raised us to appreciate the village. When she got us back, she worked very hard as a single mother to care for us. She worked too hard, but that was necessary. And to that we always, and to that we did always understand that that too was love. She had an amazing work ethic. It was love disguised as work. Being responsible at all costs, she passed on to us. Although we spent our early years attending church regularly, dad sang in the choir, mom played the piano, it was my mother who modeled for us what a non-judgmental, justice and Jesus-loving Jesus person a Christian looked like. She was authentic in a world where so many yearn to be something other than who they are. She wanted more for me, us, than we knew was possible in a world full of hate. She gave us a sense of what it meant, means to love Jesus, and even when there, and even when times were hard, her faith was very strong. She was a functioning alcoholic, but she never missed taking my granddaughter to Wednesday night Bible study and choir practice, even after working all day or having a drink or two. The lovingness of this gesture is what my daughter recalls most when thinking of her grandmother. She passed on to us the real good news of God's love and not something conjured by convenience. My mother didn't make cookies or take me to Girl Scouts. She never could quite comb a black girl's hair, but she gave us the gift of a village 
and the many big mamas who did. Her quiet demeanor, instead of daily hugs and kisses, proved to be the measure of her strength and unconditional demonstration of a non-judgmental, deep love she had for us. She taught us to be open and accepting of everyone, especially the most marginalized in our community. How she walked in the world changed me from a self-loathing, insecure little girl to a woman who, before her death and even in every day since, appreciate so deeply the way she loved and taught us to love. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We have had four stories, uh, and I'm not going to do anything other than just honor the power and the power of your group. To know Maria, she is a very present mother and an even more present grandmother. And much of her life is very much centered around her family. And so we know those seeds, uh, they grew into something. I uh, like to change my sermon title, not that it matters, because you guys are not going to remember it beyond anything. I'm going to be the one. But just so that I don't come across as misogynist and, or anything like that, um, my uh, sermonic theme is women, wells, and wrongdoing. Women, wells, and wrongdoing. As I've said a couple times before, this is our last Sunday of our love series. Uh, I happen to love uh, talking about love. <laughs> Uh, because at the core of who we are, we were created for relationships. And yet relationships, as we've heard today, can be very complicated. <laughs> Sometimes we end up doing all the things we didn't want to do and making mistakes. And things that call us to love sometimes seems like an impossible high road. Jesus even says in the Gospels, if you want to keep the law, you really want to make sure you keep the law. Love God, love self, and love others as you love yourself. That's it. This love thing is the centerpiece of all great faiths. And so we can never run out of things to say about love. And so I especially just want to thank everybody who shared this month. A while ago, a lady was dating a married man. And she had met the man, and she was single. She had met the man while at work. You, know, you stay eight hours a day with people, and things happen in the workplace. They got along well enough. And I guess you could say they really hit it off. And one thing led to another. And you see, I'm not judging the lady's choice of the man or the man's choice of the lady. They got along well enough. And he filled her ear with sweet talk. And they took trips together. And he made her feel special. And he chased away the loneliness that she felt she had been feeling, even though she still had loneliness, but not as often. And there were gifts. And for him, she was someone who appreciated him and stroked his ego. And for him, she was someone that made him feel good especially when he felt like he always had to go home to a nagging wife and three young kids, that he could never, never seem to get it right. And when I asked this lady, I said, well, what do you think of having a relationship with someone who is committed? Her response was, well, if his wife did what she needed to do to keep him, maybe he wouldn't be out here. Honestly, I was shocked by the coldness of this response. I was shocked by the selfishness of this response. But once I paused, I wasn't as amazed how well people can justify, if not rejoice in their wrongdoing, by simply explaining things away. This week, I had lunch with a colleague. Um, and he had shown an interest in this whole love sermon series. And so we were talking. We were talking about life and how things were going. And 
He's had a change of job. He's gone from the Methodist to the Lutheran. And we're talking about how is all that working for you. And he's one for pontificating. So we were talking about ministry forward and bucket list and what's left. And he ended up in Hawaii talking about if there was one wish that he could have, it would be for human beings to take a pill where they could feel another human being's pain. Ooh, that's interesting for a wish. What a novelty idea. If we could feel one another's pain. If this lady above could take a pill and actually feel maybe the pain of the wife or the pain of her lover's kid. What if we could suddenly feel the pain of those around us? If we could feel their pain fully. I'm an Oscar snob, and a few Sundays ago, the Oscars came on, and I got to hear about movies that I had seen and movies that I hadn't seen. And so, whatever the Oscars nominates, I'm like, I'm going to try to see the movie. I may not, but it's in my consciousness. And so there was one movie that got mentioned, Irishman. I said, I'm going to try, and I'm going to try and watch this movie. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie. How many of you have seen Irishman? Oh, man, I'm really in for something. <laughs> I said, not even you, Joe. <laughs> oh, you have? Okay, okay. So, uh, this is based on a nonfiction book. I heard you paint houses. To paint a house is actually cold word for killing a human being. And what it means by paint house is when you shoot the person, the blood that comes from that person is splattered on the walls. Hence, I heard you paint a house. Here was an ordinary man, the main character in the story, that got involved with a mob leader. And when his boss ordered a hit, he just did it, no questions asked, until he was ordered to kill his best friend, Hoffa. He tried to avoid this as much as possible. He tried to talk Hoffa off the edge. He tried to change the mind of his boss. But in the end, he was ordered as a hitman to kill his best friend, Hoffa. He could either kill him or he would be killed. In his lifetime, he would kill 26 people. And one of those people whom his daughter loved very much was Hoffa. And when he kills Hoffa, his daughter never speaks to him again. He tries and he tries the rest of his life as he's looking back over it, he's being interviewed for this book. He tries to get his daughter to speak to him. He tries and he tries. But she keeps refusing. He walks into the bank. He walks up to her where she's the bank teller. She puts a clothes sign and walks away. He goes to another daughter and says, hey, I want to talk to this daughter. I just, I just want to talk to her. And the daughter begins to shake. The daughter begins to cry. And she says, Daddy, do you know what your life did to us? Do you know the impact of your life on us? Reminding me that the way we love courageously or cowardly, righteously or selfishly, big or small, loud or running away, all of that impacts others. Even when you think your actions only impact you, they impact others. Like a pebble that gets thrown into a lake, rippling over the course of all the waters. This is where we enter the biblical text today. And honestly, today, it's the story, what it doesn't say, that leaves a mark on me. Here is a woman that goes to the well to draw water at a time of the day it's the hottest. She goes to the well at an unusual time. Some even say she might have intentionally gone to the well at this time to avoid traffic to avoid the eyes of the judgmental women, to avoid the naysayer and folks that got opinions about you and cannot stop them from coming. Sometimes we will go to the store at the oddest hour and drive the longest way just to avoid people. She was hostile to Jesus. He was a Jew, and as the text reminds us, she was a Samaritan, and the Jews didn't speak to the mixed breed Samaritan, so why is he even speaking to me anyway? They already thought they were better than everybody, and here they are, God's chosen people, and here she is, minding her own business, staying in her lane, and here he comes.
Thomas. She wasn't a part of the paparazzi crews or lingering crowns or a subscriber to the Inquirer, so she didn't know that Jesus inaugurated calls for people of inclusion, not exclusion, dignity, not denigration, empowerment rather than exploitation, and affirmation rather than marginalization. But here we are at the well, and this woman doesn't know all that, and furthermore is triggered and traumatized by his presence and his question. One more person asking something of me when she probably had nothing more to give. Can you fetch me some water? Do I look like your maid? Jesus is doing that thing again where he says one thing, but he means another. He's asking for this water, but really he's asking for something else. The woman at the well doesn't have the time for Jesus' shenanigans. She got frustrated with Jesus, meandering, conversation, and never no mind. She didn't know what he was talking about, and he offered her water while standing at the well. I was watching this YouTube video of a little black girl who was very light-skinned, and so often kids would question, what race are you? She was upset, and she would come home, and she would tell her dad, and she would tell her mom, and so they began to do some empowerment lessons with her, and finally, this felt good. She made a YouTube video, and she says, I'm black on the inside. I'm black on the inside, and it got me to thinking about this woman at the well, I'm her on the inside. See, sometimes we look at folks on the outside, but we can't see that they're hurt on the inside. This woman had had some wrongdoing done to her. Once Jesus had gotten her attention and some of the bitterness had been peeled away off, he asked her to fetch her husband. And she said, I have none. And Jesus says, you are honest. You have had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not you. You don't have five husbands and one you got that's not yours and not have wrongdoing done to you. She was vulnerable. She had much less agency. Jesus reveals to her that he can see that on the inside, she's her. He goes on to tell her everything she ever done. And we are spared the details, but we can use our holy, sanctified imagination. When you connect the dots of her story, you realize that this woman epitomized in many ways that society marginalizes people, so much so that she has to come to the well when no one is there. Her people, her people. I'm going to say that one more time. Her people, her people. <clears throat> In our unison prayer today, that prayer we all confess together, a friend hurts us, we hurt back. Just look in your bulletin. Someone hits us, we strike back. A family member ridicules us, we gossip about him or her. This is how we have been taught to deal with those around us, but that ain't love. Love is not wrongdoing. Hurt people hurt people, and hurt people are the best candidates for a positive response to large exposures to love. Now, we look at Trump, and somebody say he's getting a 10 somewhere. I don't know how he's getting this manufactured 10. But if you're exposed to love, then you can get a love 10. And when people say there's something different about you, you be like, I got a love 10. Everyday folks are getting exposure to something. Why not love? Jesus shattered all the taboos that held sway then. Gender discrimination, ritual purity, socioeconomic poverty, religious hostility, and the moral stigma of serial marriages. His simple request for a drink of water provided a dialogue with a marginalized woman that teaches us that God does not desire any human to be shrivel and die from a broken body and hurt, parched soul and wrongdoing, reminding us that sometimes it's more dangerous the friend you let in than the stranger you meet at the well. This is the longest discourse in all of the gospel, which might imply Jesus was willing to hang around a while, but because he could see that this woman was hurting on the inside. And when he was done with her in this living water business, she hadn't stopped hurting, but she was healing. And she did some of the best evangelism I've seen in the Bible. She brought a whole village back, curious because they saw her love to him and they wanted to know, what was Jesus doing? Lately, I have been in this phase of listening to rap music. I know, right? You know, I'm on YouTube and I'm listening to these artists rap. And one common theme 
emerges from rappers, loss and violence. 66% of rappers have lost a period. They are hurting on the inside. Then there are other relatives and violence and drugs. And you know, as I'm listening to them, I hear in their music babies who are hurting. And that hurt gets expressed as rage. And if you ever hear them talk, they will say, I'm going to do this for my mama or my kids. Mad love for family. And sometimes in that hurt and pain, we can complicate a situation that is already complicated. And our own actions, Maria's mom, the Irishman, the adulterous woman, ordinary Christian, our actions impact others. And in our hurt, our pain, our loneliness, or even our selfishness, we make decisions and choices that are not love at all. And they hurt people around us. So I end this series with Take the Pill. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about the pins that stretch and talked about love stretching. And then last week, I talked about adding sugar to bitterness. And today, I stopped by to say that sometimes you got to take the pill. I talked to you about a friend at the beginning who said sometimes we need to take that pill that allows us to feel the pain of another. As a therapist, often I see people who are dealing with chronic and acute pain that are crippled by pain, that have had to go on social security, that have had to change their lives because of this pain that is in their body. But I used to listen to the stories, and then a couple of years ago, I experienced something that brought pain home. When you asked me how much pain I was in, it wasn't a 10, it was a 15. And I know what pain can do. It can rock your mind, it can rock your world, it can take everything you love far away when you are in pain. I know what pain is in the body. And I know what it is to say, I don't even wish this on my worst enemy. When you say you don't wish something on your worst enemy, you're saying, man, this is really, really messed up. And sometimes pain is like that. And I'm inviting you all today to take the pill, but not the pill to take the pain away. I'm inviting you to take the pill to bring the pain on. I'm inviting you to take the pill to experience somebody different from you, their pain. Because maybe if we felt somebody else's pain, we'd be a little bit more empathetic to what's going on in somebody else's world. Take the pill because in experiencing other pe people's pain, it cultivates empathy in us for each other. So that wrongdoing is less tempting. If I can see a face, at the end of the tunnel, then maybe I'm less likely to sleep with this person because I realize the impact. Take the pain pill, take the pill. When you feel that judgment bone working in you, take the pill. When the person that gets under your skin, you can see them coming down the street, take the pain pill. When life tosses you lemon, take the pill. When you roll up on someone for whom your well is dry, take the pill. When you are in the midst of family who have failed you monumentally, take the pill. When it seems you couldn't be further to the left in public spheres, take the pill. When you feel most misunderstood, take the pill. Take the pill. <laughs> Love is a choice. It is a choice to care for others in a way that potentially waters the ground for others becoming the best that they can be. It is a choice with God's help only that allows us to put our best foot forward. Some of the stuff we're doing is when we go to our lower selves. But love really does call us to a right higher road. I think the writers in Corinthians got it right when they concluded that love surpassed everything. Love. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> Somebody's phone is ringing. <laughs> if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith 
so as to remove the mountains, but I do not have love. I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Amen.